to Morbidly Bewitched. In the last episode, I discussed aquamation, and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about donating your body to science. Hence, the glasses. We have a lot to get through, so let's get started. Believe it or not, in Northern Ireland alone, approximately 100 people donate their bodies to science as their choice for disposal of their own human remains. There are 19 institutes across the UK and these are all governed under the Human Tissue Act. The Human Tissue Act protects these generous donors so that when their body is in the facility for whatever length of time, usually between one to three years, depending on case studies, they are kept with the utmost respect and dignity and every single piece of paperwork required to get that person there in the first place is perfect. Every single T is crossed and every I is dotted. These specimens can be kept anywhere, like I say, between one to three years, but that is if they are embalmed to be kept, to be used time and time again by students training to be surgeons. However, someone donating their body to science may only be kept for a number of months. This is whenever already trained, qualified surgeons want to advance their skills with new technology and new equipment. And in this case, the body's not embalmed. It's a case where they are frozen and then defrosted so that whenever they're practicing their procedure, it is as close to the real subject as possible. Once a body has been allocated for fully trained surgeons to practice extra procedures, then they can only be kept for a further month after the body has thawed. For a body that's been donated and allocated as a case study for students training to be surgeons, they are embalmed. Now the embalming procedure is pretty much the same as the standard embalming procedure. The only difference is it's stronger fluid and it's put through the system at a far lower rate over a far longer period of time so that it saturates every single vessel and capillary in the entire system, which enables that body to be fully treated and last far, far longer, one to three years, quite a long time. The bodies that are dissected again by the students are looked upon by fully trained professionals from the get-go. At no stage are they left to their own devices and they are told under no uncertain terms that that body is to be treated with the utmost respect because they are an invaluable donor to the science project and students alike to enable them to develop their skills. They're also told that while they're working on that body, they are to treat that body with the same respect as if it was a family member of their own. So how do you go about donating your body to science? You can't just wait until your loved one passes away and they've maybe had a chat with you about it and says, you know what, that's not a bad old idea there. I quite like the thought of that, helping the students, helping, helping future generations and you've done nothing about it and they die and you decide, yep, well, that's what they want it. No, you cannot work it that way. This has to be done through consent forms while the person is still alive with a witness and submit it to the Institute of Anatomy, allocated to that certain university, before anything can be considered. This is not an at need choice. This is something that has to be put in paper, legalised, before you can go ahead with it. Unlike human organs, tissues, corneas, heart, lung, kidney, liver, you can donate those body parts without the donor's consent after death. But you cannot do that with the full human body. The bequeathal of the human remains must be agreed before death unwitnessed. And this is the only second requirement, the other being a signature and a witness for your body or body parts to go on display in the public eye. If you want an example of that, you could think of one of my ultimate favourite artists, Gunther van Hagen. 
if you want to look him up on YouTube, he is an amazing man, ridiculously intelligent, and he actually carried out um, public post-mortems. He had the consent of the family and the deceased at the time, before they died, um, but he also has the Body Works art exhibition where he plastinizes human remains and then strips them back to show every single perfect segment of the human body in its artistic form, right down to blood vessels, nerves, you name it, every tiny wee detail he has managed to turn into a work of art. It really, it's, it's pretty amazing. Body dissection has been carried out since the 19th century, the mid 19th century. Back then it was used and it was far more barbaric and rough and ready and there wasn't the same things anywhere near the same level of care put in place for the donated body. Whereas now it's seen as a sacred gift bestowed upon the university and rightly so. To this day, the deceased themselves are known as the silent teachers because what they give students in terms of knowledge and practice is unparalleled to any other form of diagram or book or 3D image. Because you may think to yourself, well, why would you even need that in this day and age? Why? We have all of these fantastic pieces of art. We have books on anatomy. We've got 3D imaging. You can scan people while they're still alive and see everything moving. But believe you me, when you go in there, take it from me as an embalmer, it is like spaghetti junction. You want me to find what? Seriously? Seriously? Not exaggerate. The human body, unfortunately, is not like those neat little specimens you would see sitting on top of your GP's desk, where everything's plastic, there's no fluid, and they slot into place like a neat little jigsaw puzzle. No, no, and no. We are full of water, fluid, blood, other secretions, and then every single muscle, every single tendon, your veins, your arteries is covered in connective tissue and sheaths and getting to the specific area you need, you have to move an awful lot out of the way to get to where you want to go. The thing is, and the huge difference between surgeons and what I do, is I can afford to make a mistake. Little slip of the scalpel here. Oops, I've just nicked the jugular. Not a big deal in my profession. If anything, it helps. But with the living, mm, you can lose a patient within the space of three minutes from bleeding out. After the first dissection, and remember, these dissections are carried out to perfection because the students are monitored very closely by professionals through the entire process. The body's put back together, covered up, put into cool storage, ready for the next set of students. This is also done in stages. You have your first year students and surgeons and your second year. They usually work from the neck down, learning all of the arteries in the body, the viscera, the tendons, the muscles. And then your third year graduates and, and so on will work from the neck up and they will learn everything to do with your facial features, the brain, the skull, and the entire internal mechanisms of the head. So once you've put your consent forms in while you're still alive, and you get your little letter back saying that you've been accepted into the university, yay! What happens when you actually die? Well, the institute has to be contacted immediately upon your death. It's not the funeral director, it's the institute that needs to be contacted. 
they have their own contracted people to come out and collect your remains upon your death. And they need to get you as soon as possible to avoid any kind of deterioration to the remains before the embalming treatments put into position. After you received your acceptance letter in the post while you were still alive, you would have had to have gave a copy of this to either your next of kin, your executor, solicitor, or your GP. But it is advisable that you give one to your GP anyway, because death certificates still have to be issued upon your demise, deaths still have to be registered upon your demise, everything's very standard, still normal in that sense of bureaucracy, but the difference is your GP will also give the Institute your cause of death. And at this point, your submission to science still could be rejected. An awful lot can actually happen to you between the date you submit your paperwork to be donated to science and the day that you actually die. Whenever the GP issues your death certificate to the Institute, there is a few instances where your body will not be acceptable for examination. This is things like if you died suddenly and they decided to do a post-mortem examination, you are not going to be of any use to students. Your dissection's already been carried out. If you have extensive cancer, which has metastasized right through your system, causing too much destruction to your internal organs. If you have some kind of other disorder of the immune system like HIV, AIDS, jaundice, uh, MRSA, there is a number of different reasons why a body after death wouldn't be accepted by the Institute where it was previously accepted while they were alive. If unfortunately at the time you're faced with this horrible scenario where you don't get to fulfill your loved one's wishes by donating their body to science, then you just go ahead with your standard procedures in terms of funerals. You get in touch with your funeral director, they will come out and pick up the body and everything's going to be standard traditional from there on in. If after you die, though, the death certificate has nothing there that would cause any concern, then you're still accepted by the university. Yay! Then everything can go ahead as you originally planned. Your body will be picked up by the Institute and from there on in, you are technically classed as the property of that Institute. They will keep you for that length of time. They will liaise with the family and give a rough idea of how long they maybe plan to keep the remains. They will be responsible for the storage of the deceased, the care of the deceased, and when it comes to the time of the release of the body, they will also provide at their own cost a very simple burial or cremation. Now, if you want to go for a traditional funeral once you get those remains back, then the university will not fit that bill you're going to have to pay that yourself. So there you have it. Donating your body to science. Not everybody's cup of tea, but there is no argument that the men and the women who are selfless enough to make this decision are extremely brave. Um, it's a real humanitarian approach to death where they feel that like at least they can help future generations to improve on techniques and procedures that may help their grandchildren, their grandchildren's children on down the line. So, next video is going to be body donation again, but in a slightly more extreme form. I'm going to be talking about the body farm in Texas. Please subscribe and I'll see you soon. Thank you.